Oh my god, what am I doing? Hi everybody, welcome to my channel Just Thinking Out Loud. My name is Desiree. I have an interesting video for you today. It's something I have been thinking about for a while and then I forgot about it because of what had happened last year with someone who I'll mention in a minute. So courtesy of PewDiePie, I heard about a female YouTuber called Vicky Wo who has a very interesting personality and is most famous for both that and the fact that she identifies as black even though anybody who looked at her would probably say that she is white. This whole, my whole entire life, my mom kept telling me you're white, you're white. I never believed her because I knew I was black. Thank you for understanding that I am a black girl. Now that's just one person. There was also the incident of a more famous person, Rachel Dolezal, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. I also just found out that she now calls herself another name. I guess she had to make some changes in order to make sure that her outside character fit the image of herself in her head. She was uh, the former head of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And she also identified identifies as black, even though her parents say that she's white. And I think her, it's maybe not so obvious because of the way she wears her hair or dresses up herself. And lots of people were outraged about that. Let me just ask you the question in, in simple terms again, because you've sent mixed signals over the years. Are you an African-American woman? I identify as black. You identify as black. Let me put a picture up of you in your early 20s, though. Mm -hmm. And when you see this picture, is this an African-American woman? Or is that a Caucasian woman? That's I, not in my early 20s, but... Um, That's a little younger, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 16 in that picture. Is she a Caucasian woman or an African-American woman? I would say that visibly she would be identified as, as white by people who see her. But at the time, were you identifying yourself as African-American? In that picture, during that time, no. Your parents were asked this question this week and they didn't have any trouble answering it. Here's what they said. She's clearly our birth daughter and we're clearly Caucasian. That's just a fact. Your father went on to say she's a very talented woman doing work she believes in. Why can't she do that as a Caucasian woman, which is what she is? How do you answer that question? Um, well, first of all, I. I really don't see why they're in such a rush to um, whitewash some of the work that I have done and who I am and how I've identified. And this goes back to a very early age with my self-identification with the black experience um, as, as a very young child. I don't really care that much about the situation. I think that people can do what they want and people can get outraged. But I do find it interesting comparing the logic of um, the gender fluidity or transgender movement compared to thinking about racial fluidity, which is something people don't really think about. And also, I guess there is no transracial movement now, but if things hold the way that they're going right now, maybe that will happen in the future. People really want you to honor how someone chooses to identify themselves. So the interesting thing here is that someone can choose how they are identified, even though that's not really how classification works. Classification is in the context of everything else. You fit into one category, but because we're dealing with people and um, social, social experience, then we don't want people to feel bad. I think that's really all it is. And you want to be able to honor who they see themselves as, as an individual. However, when it comes to something like race, it just goes at how people feel, which doesn't make any sense. Race seems to me to be even more arbitrary than gender. And I'm gonna try and make somewhat of a case for this thinking from an international perspective. Someone who is considered uh, white, say in Jamaica, would not be considered white, say in the United States, or considered white, say somewhere like South Africa. There are places like South Africa where they at least had, I don't know if they still have, a separate category for people who are what people in Jamaica would call mixed that doesn't exist elsewhere. And when you're within a certain country or culture, you're pretty convinced that this is how, this is the way the world works, but you might go somewhere else and then people are classified a different way depending on, 
I guess just the history or however people felt because this is somewhat arbitrary. But then there's also an interesting parallel between race and gender because if you're thinking about biological sex and gender, people can't necessarily choose their biological sex, but they can choose to change their gender by adapting a different role. So you're thinking that you're thinking that sex is the physical biological characteristics or the phenotype, but gender is what is the social role. So you can act in a different way even though gender came from the biological and physical characteristics. It was something that was produced because of those traits. The sexual dimorphism that occurred because the the male could do something better just because of the physical traits than the female, even though it's very possible for the female to do it. And then if you think about race and culture, it seems very similar in my head because you can have, I know people argue about this because it's somewhat arbitrary, but there is a genetic makeup that uh, changes how the phenotype looks. However, the culture is not so fixed because someone can choose to act in a different way. It seems like two very similar things to me even more so for race because for biological sex i think you it would you would be much more hard pressed to find um a woman who say does not have biological urges to have kids or a man who does not have biological urges to i guess like gather resources and provide than finding someone who just grew up in a certain country that the majority of the people there had a certain race and so they just adopted that culture i think there is room for crossover for both of those things a lot of room a lot of room however i think it's even more pronounced when it comes to race so people just close their ears because they don't like the way it makes them feel my question is why can riley dennis for example choose to identify as a woman and everybody is not a nice person if they say no you're a man but somebody like Rachel Dolezal cannot choose to identify as black and everybody gets super pissed off. And this is what happens when there isn't really logic being applied, but just people deciding how they feel about the situation. So what's even more fascinating to me is that there was a philosophy professor at Rhodes College who um, in March last year was ostracized by her fellow lefty (laughs) <laughs> professors and academic academic academics basically because she wrote a paper titled in defense of transracialism and it was basically making the argument that i just made because it makes sense that the same considerations that are used when thinking about transgender people or um gender fluidity it can be applied to someone who claims to be transracial So I'm going to kind of look over the article right now and I really want to point out that she considers herself a feminist scholar and she was publishing her article in a journal, a feminist philosophy journal called Hypatia. So she was basically being kicked out for wrong think by the people who are trying to kick everybody else out for wrong think because she was using logic. I think that's what just happened. And the fact that this is academia, this is a place where you should be able to put ideas out there and then debate or argue on them but what these people did was write (laughs) they wrote an open letter these people being other professors which i'm going to talk about in a second wrote a letter to the journal saying that they needed to remove the article and that it was horrible that they did it they didn't bother to debate the ideas and the points they just basically tried to kick someone out where do we see this happening all the time (laughs) i'm going to read the abstract of this paper that is titled In Defense of Transracialism. The professor's name is Rebecca Tuvel. She was afraid of being blacklisted by her peers because of thinking. Former NAACP chapter head Rachel Dolezal's attempted transition from the white to the black race occasioned heated controversy. Her story gained notoriety at the same time that Caitlyn Jenner graced the cover of Vanity Fair, signaling a growing acceptance of transgender identity. Yet criticisms of Dolezal for misrepresenting her birth race indicate a widespread social perception that it is neither possible nor acceptable to change one's race in the way it might be to change one's sex. 
Considerations that support transgenderism seem to apply equally to transracialism. Although Dolezal herself may or, or may not represent a genuine case of a transracial person, her story and the public reaction to it serve helpful illustrative purposes. That's the end of it. I think that those helpful illustrative purposes are that people aren't really applying logic and that it really depends on how people feel and what is happening in academia. Because this is a place where if you have an idea, you put it out there and this lady gave her arguments on what happened. People didn't debate her arguments. They basically wrote to the journal. I'm going to go read an article about their open letter. They wrote to the journal and said that this is horrible. Why did you publish this? Instead of actually debating her arguments. Okay, I'm going to read the beginning of the open letter to the journal. These are some of the people who signed the letter. Elise Springer of Wesleyan University, Alexis Shotwell of Carleton University, who's the point of contact on the letter, Dilek Hussein Zadegan of Emory University, excuse me, Laurie Gruen of Wesleyan, and Shannon Winbust of Ohio State University. To Hypatia editor Sally Skulls and the broader Hypatia community, as scholars who have long viewed Hypatia, a journal of feminist philosophy, as a valuable resource for our communities, we write to request the retraction of a recent article entitled In Defense of Transracialism. Its continued availability causes further harm, as does an initial post by the journal, admitted only that the article sparks dialogue. Our concerns reach beyond mere scholarly disagreement. We can only conclude that there has been a failure in the review process, and one that painfully reflects a lack of engagement beyond white and cisgender privilege. Well, it is not the aim of this letter to provide an exhaustive list of problems that this article exhibits or to provide a critical response, we would like to note a few points that are indicative of the larger issues. We believe that this article falls short of scholarly standards in various areas. One, it uses vocabulary and frameworks not recognized, accepted, or adopted by the conventions of the relevant subfields. For example, the author uses the language of transgenderism and engages in dead naming a trans woman. Two, so social offense. Two, it mischaracterizes various theories and practices relating to religious identity and conversion. For example, the author gives an offhand example about conversion to Judaism. I don't see why this matters based on the principal arguments of what the paper said, the article said. Three, it misrepresents leading accounts of belonging to a racial group. For example, the author incorrectly cites Charles Mills as a defender of voluntary racial identification. Four, it fails to seek out and sufficiently engage with scholarly work by those who are most vulnerable to the intersection of racial and gender oppressions. <laughs> Women of color, in this discussion of transracialism, we endorse Hepatia's stated commitment to actively reflect and engage the diversity within feminism, the diverse experiences and situations of women, and the diverse forms that gender takes around the globe. And we find that this submission was published without being held to that commitment. So none of this is about the core arguments about the similarities between transgender fluidity and transracial fluidity. None of this. All of this is like, they didn't do it in the right way and we didn't like what they said. And they didn't go and talk to people like me who are the most oppressed. Okay. <laughs> That's all. I don't really care much for this topic. I just, the hypocrisy about everything is what interests me. I started this video talking about Vicky Wu, but that's more focusing on pop culture and about how people out there want to feel, which is whatever. But this is really about people who are basically being paid to think, being asked to close their minds and this being acceptable because they have, apparently they have privilege just because they don't say the right thing, white and cisgendered privilege and because they're causing harm, AKA hurting people's feelings. Not harm, like actually hurting someone, but just, oh, I don't like what that person wrote. It made me feel uncomfortable. Well, how else do you explore topics and further advance human knowledge except through that? So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, do not forget to donate to the channel at justthinkingoutloud.tv slash donate. I will talk to you soon. Have an awesome day. Goodbye.